All right. Well, tonight we are jumping into the book of Kings, first Kings. Um, and uh, we finished up with the uh, book of second Samuel two weeks ago. Um, and David was towards his last days and wrapping up his uh, season of leadership. Um, and so now we're going to jump in and something to be mindful of is so far in the history of the kings of Israel, we have never had a succession from father to son. And so David <laughs> never set this up. Uh, you know, he's one of the things that is important when we talk about estate planning is, you know, let your, let your kids know what you want. Um, otherwise, that leads to conflict. And this is uh, the opening chapter of First Kings. Uh, we do see that conflict uh, start to develop, um, but largely the, because the nation has never been here before. All of the, uh, the, the closest thing to a uh, line of succession is with the high priest. And the high priest and his son, his oldest son is the next in line and on down, but they've never had a king in this role. Um, and so who's going to be king next? You don't want to just assume, because uh, that doesn't always work out for Adonijah. So uh, let's jump in, uh, starting in verse one. When King David was very old, he could not keep warm, even when they put covers over him. So his attendants said to him, let us look for a young virgin to serve the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our Lord, the king may keep warm. Then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful young woman and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The woman was very beautiful. She took care of the king and waited on him, but the king had no sexual relations with her. So this is um, this opening passage here is part of what they're communicating to us is the uh, is David's loss of strength and virility. And so in the past, David was not one to shy away from a beautiful woman, as we have learned in his life. Um, and so here we are, we are hearing like, he can't even keep warm. He is unable to, um, yeah, he's not really interested in any kind of sexual activity, but Avishag is brought in simply to warm him uh, with another warm body next to him. And there's nothing untoward happening in their relationship at all, um, but she is just one of the servants uh, serving the king in this way. So she probably would have also taken uh, cares to like, clean and bathe and all those kinds of things, kind of like a nurse um, would may have been a part of her responsibility as well. Um, but we are really being told here early on, David is uh, no longer as strong, as powerful as he once was. And that's part of the reason why we have that introduced here is because uh, his sons now are going to start working through like, who's going to be king. And, you know, before David passes away, Adonijah sees this as his opportunity to assert his his uh, his claim. Uh, so let's look at verse, uh, what was that, five. <clears throat> Adonijah, whose mother was Hagith, put himself forward and said, I will be king. So he got chariots and horses ready with 50 men to run ahead of him. His father had never rebuked him by asking, why do you behave as you do? He was also very handsome and was born next to next after Absalom. Adonijah conferred with Joab, son of Zariah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and ga they gave him their support. But Zadok, the priest, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, and Ray, and David's special guards did not join Adonijah. Adonijah then sacrificed sheep, cattle, and fattened calves at the stone of Zoheleth near Enrogel, he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaiah, or the special guard, or his brother Solomon. So, the Adonijah is next in line. He is David's fourth son. And so, Amnon was killed by Absalom. 
Absalom was killed by Joab. And then there's this other son, Calabeth, and we don't really know what happened to him, but we uh, or how he died, but he is gone. He's not in the picture anymore. Um, and so Adonijah is just looking at the way things have been with other inheritance lines, like, well, I'm next up. But the challenge here is David has so many different wives. And in if we look at the patriarchs, there are, um, and specifically with Jacob, who had four different um, women with whom he had children, two wives and two concubines. Uh, and it was his favorite wife, Rachel, and her oldest son, Joseph, that he favored, even though Joseph was like ninth or 10th born, maybe 10th. Uh, he was way down the list. Um, and so he is, uh, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, we see like this line of primogenitor is not something that is just necessarily the first, the next firstborn, the next oldest. Um, often a pattern in scripture is the younger taking over the role of the elder. And so here, Solomon being a younger son uh, than Adonijah, he is not out of play for the line of, of, um, of the kingship, but um, Adonijah is going to go for it because David's still alive. And what we hear is David never rebuked him. Why are you doing this? Which is a theme in the life of David with his sons, not rebuking them. And if he had stood up to Amnon, how would his family be different? If he had stood up to Absalom, how would his life be different? Uh, but he does not rebuke his sons, and Adonijah is one of them. So Adonijah starts throwing this party um, and it basically doing all of the things that would be a part of the celebration of um, a, anointing a new king. And he even invites a priest. He invites the military leader, Joab. He is building a coalition with his people from Judah and they, even going to a city in Judah to throw this party to secure his base. Um, and so while he's making these moves, we're also told that he doesn't invite some pretty important people. And so people like Zadok, the priest, Benaiah, Nathan, uh, and his, his brother Solomon. All the other brothers are invited, but not Solomon. So that is another key to help us see like, Adonijah knew that there's there's something about Solomon. Now we, as we're reading through this, we are not given all of the information about Solomon's claim to the throne. Remember, Solomon is um, David's son with Bathsheba. Um, he is low on the list, technically, if we were to like follow the line of like a Leverett type marriage. Um, and David is a kinsman redeemer for Bathsheba after Uriah the Hittite died. If we were following that, that Solomon would actually still be Uriah's heir. <laughs> but he, we're not totally following that line. Um, and so, but he is uh, setting himself, Adonijah is setting himself up. Solomon has some kind of claim. And Nathan is going to start working the angles here to get Solomon to be uh, anointed king instead of Adonijah. Um, and so that's where we turn in verse 11. Then Nathan asked Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and our Lord David knows nothing about it? I just love this. He, he, David doesn't know what's going on. Uh, now then, let me advise you how you can save your own life and the life of your son, Solomon. Go into King David and say to him, my Lord, the king, did you not swear to me, your servant? Surely Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? While you are still there talking to the king, I will come in and add my word to what you have said. So this is the plan. Now, does anybody know where David said this to Bathsheba? It's not in the Bible. It's not in scripture. It's never been a promise uh, to Bathsheba that we have recorded. Maybe there was a conversation that they had at some point. I don't know. But Nathan 
has a particular fondness for Bathsheba. And uh, because perhaps because of Bathsheba's, uh, the tragedy of her relationship with Uriah and David's uh abuse in this situation and abuse of his power. Uh, but, and so he also has a fondness for Solomon and he recognizes that Solomon uh, is, is special to the Lord. And so they're setting up the scheme uh, to talk to David, to say, Hey, you made this promise to Solomon. Um, and so that's the plan. So Bathsheba verse 15 went to see the aged King in his room where Abishag, the Shunammite, was attending him. Bathsheba bowed down, pros prostrating herself before the king. What is it you want? The king asked. She said to him, my lord, you yourself swore to me, your servant, by the lord your god. Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. But now Adonijah has become king, and you, my lord, the king, do not know about it. He has sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calves and sheep, and has invited all the king's sons, Abiathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army. <clears throat> but he has not invited Solomon, your servant. My lord, the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to learn from you who will sit on the throne of my lord, the king after him. Otherwise, as soon as my lord, the king is laid to rest with his ancestors, I and my son Solomon will be treated as criminals. And this is a real threat because in ancient world, like the uh, when a king came to power, all the other people who could possibly claim the throne, they were usually eliminated. And so this could be this could be a legit threat that Bathsheba is addressing. So 22, while she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet arrived. And the king was told, Nathan the prophet is here. So he went before the king and bowed with his face to the ground. Nathan said, have you, my lord, the king, declared that Adonijah shall be king after you and that he will sit on your throne? Today he has gone down and sacrificed a great number of cattle, fattened calves and sheep. He has invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest. Right now they are eating and drinking with him and saying, long live king Adonijah. But me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon, he did not invite. Is this something my lord the king has done without letting his servants know who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? So this is a, uh, they're putting it on David. David, you have to make a decision right now. What are you going to do? Who's going to be king? And we don't have record of a previous conversation, like I said, um, but it is, uh, it seems like Nathan is acting in a, a way that is in, in line with God's will, even though we don't have it all squared away. Because Solomon will become king, spoiler alert, uh, Solomon will become king, but he is, um, yeah, he, Ab Abijah is working his own plan, and David is going to try to, David doesn't want somebody to take initiative away from him. It was part of his uh, his personality as well. So they're playing all the angles here. Like, hey, Adam is just doing this whole thing without you. Uh, he's just doing it, didn't talk to you about it. Um, and so David, in verse 28, then King David said, call in Bathsheba. So she came into the king's presence and stood before him. The king then took an oath, as surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of every trouble, I will surely carry out this very day what I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel. Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne in my place. So David remembers that. Cool. Uh, good. Uh, then Bathsheba bowed down with her face to the ground, prostrating herself before the king and said, May my Lord, King David, live forever. King David said, call in Zadok, the priest, Nathan, the prophet, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. When they came before the king, he said to them, take your Lord's servants with you. Have Solomon, my son, mount my own mule and take him down to Gihon or Gihon. There have Zadok, the priest, and Nathan, the prophet, anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, long live King Solomon. Then you are to go up with him and he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place i have appointed him ruler over israel and judah and so these things that uh david is doing that there's these two different people claiming to be uh pre like the priests uh, the high priest role zadok and abiathar 
and David doesn't super trust Ab Abiathar anyway. Um, and then Joab was a his David's general, but David has been distancing himself from Joab as well. And so Benaiah is rising in prominence uh, as the leader of David's military. So he has the priest and the military and then Nathan, the prophet, uh, coming in to um, affirm this anointing of Solomon. And so when Dave, uh, David tells him to ride on the king's mule, uh, and the mule actually was the preferred transportation for kings because it was a um, it was a non-threatening animal. And so like a victorious king riding on, an, on a mule uh, was something that uh, was part of the way that they were communicating. Like, I come in peace, but also like, I'm not afraid of you. Uh, and so riding on the mule and all of these different things, anointing him publicly, uh, declaring long live King Solomon, all of these things, David is doing a counter coronation to Abiathar's or Adonijah's plan um, and, but David is the king. As long as he's alive, he's the king. And so he has the right to make these claims. So verse 36, Benaiah son of Jehoiada answered the king, amen. May the Lord, uh, may the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, so declare it as the Lord was with my Lord, the king. So may he be with Solomon to make his throne even greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. So Zadok, the priest, Nathan, the prophet, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Carathites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon mount King David's mule, and they escorted him to Gihon. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpet, and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went up after him, playing pipes and rejoicing greatly, so that the ground shook with the sound. So this is a big deal, the ground shaking with the sound. Now, I was uh, at... The game that is now famously called Beast Quake, and uh, that was an exciting moment where, like the 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 pure celebration of just the most epic run in Seahawks history. It was awesome. Uh, created a seismic event uh, in Seattle. It was really cool. This uh, is farther away from like where. Uh, Adonijah is is farther away uh, than where the seismic readings uh, are from the Seattle uh, stadiums. Like that's at the university. So this is actually farther away than the university. And they all heard it and felt it over there because that's what uh, we get to here in, in Adonijah's thing. Now, one of the things about the anointing oil, um, this is not just a little like cross on the forehead. This is like pouring oil on the king um, uh, on Solomon. And there's a, one of the, the Psalms of Ascent talks about how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. I think it's 127. Nope. Uh, one something, something. All right. It is one of the, oh, 133, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as the dew of Hermon were falling, falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. And so this is one of the, the imagery here is like the anointing of the priest or the anointing of a king. And this is a psalm written by David talking about unity in among the people. And so, you know, it would not be unusual for a psalm like this to be uh, to be prayed and sung at a coronation. You know, as like we the king is supposed to be a unifying picture for our figure for the people of Israel. And so, um, yeah, so Solomon is now drenched with anointing oil. Uh, and they go back, they're celebrating the party, they're partying, they're making a big ruckus. Verse 41 then picks up uh, Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they were finishing their feast. On hearing the sound of the trumpet, Joab asked, what's the meaning of all the noise in the city? Even as he was speaking, Jonathan, son of Abiathar, the priest arrived. Adonijah said, come in, a worthy man like you must be bringing good news. Not at all, 
<laughs> Jonathan answered, our Lord King David had made Solomon king. The king has sent him with Zadok, the priest, Nathan, the prophet, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, the Carathites and the Pelethites, and they have put him on the king's mule, and Zadok, the priest, and Nathan, the prophet, have anointed him king at Gihon. From there, they have gone up cheering, and the city resounds with it. That's the noise you hear. Moreover, Solomon has taken his seat on the royal throne. Also, the royal officials have come to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, May your God make Solomon's name more famous than yours, and his throne greater than yours. And the king bowed in worship on his bed and said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. So, yeah, Jonathan, I don't have good news at all. Look at everything that's happening. So, when we read through passages like this in the Old Testament, like there's a lot of repetition. We like this, the repetition is there to help us see the significance of this event. You know, even like the passing of Queen Elizabeth. I don't know if anybody watched that. My wife will tell you that she watched it, but really she fast forwarded most of it. She's, she saw a few things and then fast forwarded because it's so boring. <laughs> like there's so much stuff going on and so many different things and a lot of waiting. And, but there's every single part of that ceremony was something that was, or her funeral was something that she requested and there was a significance to it. And, and so here, like we are being told the significance of all these different events over and over again, because this is the first successful transition from a father to a son. Uh, and it's important to see like that it, people are celebrating, people are rejoicing. And David himself is even saying, this is what I want. This is, this is good. God has been good to me. Um, and so while it is repetitive, it does feel boring. Um, and you can get like, oh, how much more of this? Um, it's there on purpose. The writer was not just like, I don't know if I said this already. I'll say it again. Um, so they're trying to emphasize, emphasize, emphasize. Verse 49, at this, all Adonijah's guests rose in alarm and dispersed. So like, hey, we're kind of throwing some treason party here. <laughs> Bye. Uh, but Adonijah, in fear of Solomon, went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Then Solomon was told Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon and is clinging to the horns of the altar. He says, let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Solomon replied, if he shows himself to be worthy, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, but if evil is found in him, he will die. Then King Solomon sent men and they brought him down from the altar and Adonijah came and bowed down to the king, uh, to King Solomon. And Solomon said, go to your home. And so Adonijah, as everybody's running away, he goes to the tabernacle and goes into where the altar is. And the altar had these corner pieces that were like looked like horns um and so he's holding on to the altar saying like may my life be forfeit here essentially and trying to claim sanctuary in the lord's house in his tent um and, and so he's giving the king demands which like the the guts here i'm like hey i was trying i know you know how just a few minutes ago i was trying to be king i want you to not kill me king um and so D D solomon's response is like you know if he's a good person he has nothing to fear if he proves himself to be honorable nothing's going to happen to him um and so uh so that's where we seem to leave uh solomon what's up michael um and so adonijah he sorted himself out it looks like now we've got a little bit more with David uh, finishing up some business in his kingdom. Uh, we're in first Kings chapter two. Um, when the king, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. He said, so be strong, act like a man and observe what the Lord, your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. And so this was the covenant that the Lord made with David 
way back in Second Samuel that he would always have a, a descendant sitting on the throne. But here, David is also reminding, like, you've got to hold on to the ways of the Lord. You've got to hold on to his commands, walk in his path. And so uh, verse five picks up. Now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zariah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime, as if in battle. And with that blood, he stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. So remember Joab killed these two generals, but he also killed Absalom, which David does not mention here um, because that was a, that was a, that was a war. And like he was at war with Absalom, but these other two, these were folks who were uh, in, in David's alliance at this point, they were, they had made peace with the house of Saul and David or Joab still killed uh, Abner. Uh, because he thought he he was spying on on David, and so he killed him. But um, yeah, da Joab is a, a murderer, is what David is saying, and so he should not just die peacefully. And so Solomon will handle that. Um, and then it goes on, but show kindness to the sons of Barzillai of Gilead, and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And so the sharing the table with the king was a sign of great honor. Remember, David brought Mephibosheth to sit at his table. Um, and so here, the sons of Barzillai of Gilead, they are also supposed to be a part of the king's, um, the king's household, essentially, like be part of the family, like you're at Olive Garden. Uh, and remember, you have, uh, you have with you Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjamite, from Bahurim, Bahurim, who called down bitter curses on the day on me the day I went to Mahanaim, when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do with him. Bring his gray head down to the grave and blood. So David said, I promised I wouldn't kill him, but I didn't make any promises for you. <laughs> so <laughs> do what you see fit. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, seven years in Hebron, and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. So David is giving Solomon charges to finish up the last hanging threads of David's, uh, of the people who have wronged David, essentially. And so, uh, but, but wait. We're not done with Adonijah just yet. In verse uh, 13, now Adonijah, the son of Hagith, went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Bathsheba asked him, do you come peacefully? He answered, yes, peacefully. Then he added, I have something to say to you. You may say it, she replied. Now, this is the queen mother at this point. Like She's a, a very important person in, in, a, in a monarchy. And he's coming and asking a favor. As you know, he said, the kingdom was mine. <laughs> All Israel looked to me as their king, but things changed. <laughs> and the kingdom has gone to my brother, for it has come to him from the Lord. Now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. You may make it, she said. So he continued, please ask King Solomon. He will not refuse you to give me Abishag, the Shunammite, as my wife. Very well, Bathsheba replied. I will speak to the king for you. So. This may be an innocent request, but because we know that Abishag was not a concubine, like David never had any sexual relations with, with her. And so in the past, we have seen that the, when Absalom kicked David out, he slept with all of David's concubines. And that was a show of power and dominance saying there's a new king in town. And so maybe... Maybe Adonijah is, is, is asking a simple request, but Solomon isn't going to read it that way. So when Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, the king stood up to meet her, bowed down to her, and sat down on his throne. He had a throne brought for the king's mother, and she sat down at his right hand. 
I have one small request to make of you, she said. Do not refuse me. The king, king replied, make it, my brother. I will not refuse you. So she said, let Abishag the Shunammite be given in marriage to your brother Adonijah. King Solomon answered his mother, why do you request Avishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? You might as well request the, the kingdom for him. After all, he is my older brother. Yes, for him and for Abiathar the priest and, and Joab son of Zariah. So he, he's saying, we do this, all the conspirators against me, like we're giving them all the power, is how Solomon has seen this. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if Adonijah does not pay with his life for this request. And now, as surely as the Lord lives, he who has established me securely on the throne of my father David and has found a dynasty for me, as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. So King Solomon gave orders to Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and he struck down Adonijah and he died. So Solomon killed his brother because he saw the percolating of a new rebellion. And so whereas David did not take care of Absalom's percolating rebellion, Adonijah, uh, Solomon quickly addresses it. Again, this is messed up. Like we can all agree, like this is not how families should act. Uh, but this is also, you know, kings and politics and power. And, um, and so this was not outside of how the ancient world would have handled these kinds of conflicts. So Let's keep that in mind. These are real people uh, with real uh, cultures and politics that they lived in. So, so Adonijah proved himself to not be worthy and not going to live a quiet life. He broke the, the command that Solomon gave to him. So he died. To, Ab to Abiathar the priest, the king said, go back to your fields in Anathoth. You deserve to die, but I will not put you to death now. Because you carried the ark of the sovereign Lord before my father David and shared all my father's hardships. So Solomon removed Abiathar the priesthood from the priesthood uh, of the Lord, fulfilling the word the Lord had spoken at Shiloh about the house of Eli. So that goes all the way back. The Abiathar is in the line of Eli, and the Lord said through Samuel, Eli's household will be removed from the priesthood. And so now this is finally coming uh, to fulfillment. Um, so when the news reached Joab, who had conspired, conspired with Adonijah, uh, though not with Absalom, he fled to the tent of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar <laughs> It worked for someone before King Solomon was told that Joab had fled to the tent of the Lord and he was beside the altar. Then Solomon ordered Benaiah, son of jo jo Jehoiada, go strike him down. So Benaiah entered the tent of the Lord. And said to Joab, the king says, come out. But he answered, no, I will die here. Benaniah reported to the king, this is how Joab answered me. Then the king commanded Benaniah, do as he says. <laughs> Strike him down and bury him. And so clear me of and my whole family of the guilt of the innocent blood that Joab shed. The Lord will repay him for the blood he shed. Because without my father, David, knowing it, he attacked two men and killed them with the sword. Both of them, Abner, son of Ner, commander of Israel's armies, and Amasa, son of Jether, commander of Judah's army, were better men and more upright than he. May the guilt of their blood rest on the head of Joab and his descendants forever. But on David and his descendants, his house and his throne, may there be the Lord's peace forever. So Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, went up and struck down Joab and killed him. And he was buried in his, at his home out in the country. The king put Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, over the army of Joab in Joab's position and replaced Abiathar with Zadok, the priest. So he's handling all of these final charges from David. Um, so the unjust actions of Joab are handled. Now, this is in the tabernacle, and there should be no death in the tabernacle. Um, but Joab is a man of death. He is a man of violence. And so we don't see a, any kind of punishment for, for killing Joab in the tabernacle, but it is something that like, we should be mindful of. Like, this is a significant move 
like for Solomon to say like, hey, Joab was told to come out by his king's representative and he refused. He said, I'll die here. And that's, Solomon's like, let him, let it, let's let him live up to it. Like, if that's what he wants. Give it to him. Um, and so, yeah. But also we should note, Solomon will build a new home for the Ark of the Covenant in the temple and in just a few chapters. Um, and so the tabernacle is uh, going to be less significant shortly as far as chapters go. It's years from this point to that point. But um, it's, there's, also, there's maybe a, a bit of a transition in emphasis as the writer of First Kings is uh, compiling these different narratives. So then the king sent for Shimei and said to him, build yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there, but do not go anywhere else. The day you leave and cross the Kidron Valley, you can be sure you will die. Your blood will be on your own head. Shimei answered the king, what you say is good. Your servant will do as my Lord, the king has said. And Shimei stayed in Jerusalem for a long time. So he's basically on house arrest as somebody who is untrustworthy. And so Solomon's like, I don't, I don't relish killing people. <laughs> I'll give you some parameters. Stay in there. You'll be fine. So Shimei is handling that. But three years later, two of Shimei's slaves ran off to Akish, son of Maaka, king of Gath. And Shimei was told, your slaves are in Gath. At this, he saddled his donkey and went to Akish at Gath in search of his slaves. So Shimei went away and brought the slaves back from Gath. So they ran to Philistine country to be to get out of the kingdom of Israel. So it's not just they left Jerusalem, they left the kingdom of Israel. And David uh, or Solomon's command was like, don't leave Jerusalem. He's like, you went even further than what I told you not to do. Um, so when Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had returned, the king summoned Shimei and said to him, did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you on the day you leave to go anywhere else, you can be sure you will die. At that time, you said to me, what you say is good, I will obey. Why then did you not keep your oath to the Lord and obey the command I gave you? So David, or Sol I keep doing this, this is going to take a while. Solomon uh, highlights that this is an oath before the Lord and making an oath before the Lord is something you don't do lightly. And when we read in the commandments, do not take the Lord's name in vain. It's not just saying like, uh, like just saying, oh my God, that's not taking the Lord's name in vain. It's taking the Lord's name and putting it on something that you have no intention of living out or taking the Lord's name and putting it on something that the Lord has no desire to be associated with. Those are, those are really the F, the essence of taking the Lord's name in vain. And so here you break an oath that you made in the Lord's name. That is a capital offense. And so <laughs> Solomon is saying all of these things, uh, reminding him, you made an oath to me, you made an oath before the Lord, now uh, I have to fulfill the oath. The king also said to Shimei, you know in your heart all the wrong you did to my father David, now the Lord will repay you for your wrongdoing, but King Solomon will be blessed, and David's throne will remain secure before the Lord forever. Then the king gave the order to Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck Shimei down, and he died. The kingdom was now established in Solomon's hands. So Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, coming through as Solomon needed, like all of these people. So he sent Benaiah. Benaiah was like, all right, <laughs> okay. Um, so if we remember, Benaiah is one of David's mighty men. And he is the one who went into the pit with a lion on a snowy day. He was the one who grabbed the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Like this is a guy who's not afraid to to do the hard things um and he's he on he honors david uh, and solomon and by obeying these hard commands um uh, but he is the arm of justice for the early kingdom of solomon so all of this is happening uh we get about a three-year window here where david or david dies and solomon is cleaning house of all of these charges. Uh, chapter three, then we get a bit of a turn. Solomon is established a little bit more in his kingdom. And um, we are, we're going to read about Solomon asking the Lord for wisdom. 
and we're going to see him acting wisely. But before we do that, we're going to see him acting unwisely and walking outside of the ways of the Lord. Because remember, David's command to him was follow the ways of the Lord and his commands, and the law of Moses. One of those laws was don't marry women from other kingdoms. Chapter 3, verse 1. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. So one of the major downfalls for Solomon and for the monarchy, for the rest of the history of the people of Israel and Judah, is marrying other women from other countries. And that the reason is not because God is like racist. It's because these other countries worship other gods. And the hearts of the people will be drawn towards these other gods. And so if the king is doing this, that this is where like trickle, trickle down theory actually works. Like if leadership's corrupt, it works. It's all the way down to all the people because it's like, well, he's fine and he's in charge. And so Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord on the wall around Jerusalem. So we're told here that he's going to do these projects um, and we're given the priority in how he is building this, the palace, and then the temple, and then the wall. His palace was first. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father, David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. And so these high places were part of the Canaanite system of worship. There were all these different towns where like, they, like up on a hill where they would make their sacrifices to their gods. And the people of Israel came in and they were making sacrifices to Yahweh on these high places because it was a culturally, it made sense. There's this idea in the ancient world of, of things called thin places where the um, the spiritual and the, the corporeal, the, the material are close. And often like high, pl high places, hill hillsides, mountains, those were considered to be thin places because you were closer to the divine. And so they would make these offerings at these different places. And here, like it says, they were still doing this because Solomon hadn't built the temple yet. And so there's a, a, a bit of grace in this waiting for the temple to be built God's not going to come and it's not just like, I'm going to wipe them out right now. They haven't been instructed to come to the temple yet. They should be coming to the tabernacle, but the temple is what, kind of what they're waiting for. Um, and so David uh, or Solomon was still doing this as well. So he went to, uh, to uh, Gibeon in verse four. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices for that was the most important high place. And so the tabernacle probably was there with the ark and everything at Gibeon. Um, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar at Gibeon. The Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And so Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father, David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and you have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, my Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to do and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. And so. Solomon is displaying some humility here. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like I need help. And when it says, give me a discerning heart, it is the translation is, is literally a, a listening heart. And for the King to be a listener, to ask questions, to, to pay attention, to learn and to discern right from left, good from evil righteous from wicked. All of these things are things that he knows he needs and he doesn't have. And so he is in this dream encounter with the Lord. 
And he asks, I just need wisdom. <laughs> it's what I need. And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, or and nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administrating justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. So throwing the big party, uh, like God answered my prayer. You know, it's one of those things like if we were, you know, outside of the Bible, you know, find a genie lamp and it gives you three wishes and every kid is like, well, you ask for unlimited wishes. That's your first thing. Right. Um, and so Solomon knows God's not just a genie in a lamp. I can't just ask for unlimited wishes. And so he asks for wisdom. And God sees the wisdom in his request and, and makes this more extravagant promise. And all the things that God promises here to Solomon, he keeps these promises. Solomon does become a prominent king in the, in the region. People from other nations come to learn from the wisdom of Solomon. Like this is a, a significant moment, but we also will learn that Solomon was an idiot. He was an idiot and he he had all this wisdom and power and majesty, but he still was selfish. And, uh, and it started here in this chapter. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. That's, that's, the, that's the way in that brings Solomon down. So, um, so he returns to Jerusalem, throws a party. And we'll see his wisdom start to be revealed. Verse 16, now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. Now, there is some controversy in that right there because we are told in the law that prostitution is not allowed. So what are these women doing here like in Jerusalem and that they have access to the king? Like this is a, a, a strange thing. And something that we should remember is that the people of Israel, they had the law but they really were not very good at keeping the law. And so there was never really a time, like an ideal time in the history of Israel where everybody was like, we're doing so good at this trust in the Lord thing and following his commands. And so even here, two prostitutes are in the kingdom and nobody's like, hey, wait a second, you're a prostitute. We're not supposed to have prostitutes. Nope, they, they have a, a problem and they come to the king. One of them said, pardon me, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. That There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son, and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. The other woman said, no, the living one is, the, is my son. The dead son is yours. But the first one insisted, no, the dead one is yours. The living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. And so this is a tragic story. Uh, like the loss of an infant is always a tragic story. But here there's also loss of an infant and deceit and kidnapping. All of these things are happening between these two women. Um, and it is literally a she said, she said situation because there was no one else in the house. It was just the two of them at the time. And even like, like, is this the, the night the second son was born that this happened? Like they were, they were completely alone. And so maybe no one else has even seen their children to be able to say, no, that's your kid. I saw you with that kid. And so this is a, a very difficult uh, situation here. So. The king said, this one says, my son is alive and your son is dead. Well, that one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king 
He then gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son. And she said to the king, please, my Lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave this ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict that the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. So not a, not an, not, uh, that's not a recommended plan to solve this kind of a uh, of situation, but like what Solomon is, is doing is creating a crisis to reveal the truth. And for the woman who already lost a baby, like she's not going to care if somebody else loses a baby. Like it seems more fair to her. We both lost now. And so Solomon in doing this, and I really hope that Solomon was never really going to cut this baby in half. Like I really hope, um, but he created a crisis to reveal truth and it, it panned out the way he had hoped that the woman who, who had, this was her, the living baby was hers, was wanted the baby to continue to live more than saying like, I, you're mine. It's like, you're alive. And as a, as parents, like, I feel like all of us could probably say like, I would rather you be alive uh, than not alive <laughs> for all of our children. And, and so this is what revealed the truth. And so word gets out that all of these, um, that this ruling, like, is spread throughout the town that look what Solomon has done. Look at his harsh decision, but also and it revealed the truth. Um, one of the things as well to note here is the um, the phrase filled with compassion. In Hebrew, it's translated as her bowels grew hot because we often think about compassion in our heart, um, but the emotional state uh, in for the, Hebrew mind uh, was really in the guts, like, and we we've all had those moments, like, right, where you're anxious and nervous, and you feel that in your guts, or where you know, like, this is a gut decision, like, I need to just do this, like, this is like where this the the seat of emotion and reason is not from the brain or the heart, but it's from the gut, um, and so yeah, just a fun little fact, uh, so. I don't know if you guys remember Mark Lowry. Anybody remember Mark Lowry, the comedian? He has a whole bit on this about talking about Solomon's, uh, in the Song of Solomon, his descriptions of how beautiful his wife is. Um, and one of the things what he talks about, and it stuck with me all the way back from when I was like eight years old. And he said that a, a Hebrew Valentine's Day card was like, girl, you make my liver quiver. <laughs> Stuck with me all these years. <laughs> so <laughs> that is that. Um, so uh, chapter four, then we start to get into Solomon's um, kingdom uh, administration. And we will wrap up with chapter four. So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. So King Solomon ruled over all Israel. And these were his chief officials, Azariah, son of Zadok, the priest, El El Hero, El Elihiroref, that guy, son of Shisha, secretaries, Jehoshaphat, son of Ahalud, recorder, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, commander-in-chief, Zadok and Abiathar, priests, Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the district governors. So that was a little note there, Zadok and Abiathar, priests. And remember, he had sent Abiathar away, but the anointing of the Lord is still on Abiathar in some regard. And so Abiathar is going to be priest until Abiathar dies. It's kind of like right now we have two popes. You know, Benedict is still alive, Benedict the 16th and Francis. So Benedict is Pope Emeritus, but he's still like the Pope. Um, so it's that, that, that similar situation where there is a uh, anointing that, that rests still. Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the district governors. And so Nathan here could be Nathan the prophet or it could be Nathan David's brother. We're not really sure which Nathan we're talking about there. Uh, and Zabat, son of Nathan, a priest and advisor to the king. So again, we don't know which Nathan we're looking at here. If it's Nathan the prophet, these two sons of Nathan are given a, a place of privilege. And it could be Solomon recognizing Nathan and his machinations to get him to be king. 
and giving them, them uh, roles of prominence as a way of saying, thank you, Nathan. Could be. Uh, Ahishar, palace administrator, Adoniram, son of Abda, in charge of forced labor. So that is a significant piece, in charge of forced labor. Because remember, the people of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt, and God rescued them. And now Solomon is a king who has a cabinet secretary, essentially, who's in charge, in charge of slaves. And we go back to uh, chapter 3. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He's so he's already falling into the ways of Egypt, the ways of empire abusing and putting people into forced labor. So something to note, Solomon is kind of an idiot. Solomon had 12 district governors of over all Israel who supplied provisions for the king and the royal household. Each one had to provide supplies for one month in the, in the year. Uh, these are their names. And so instead of breaking up by tribes, these divisions are uh, new geographic borders. And so there's overlaps between different tribes. And so this could be Solomon trying to build a new kind of structure to solidify uh, his government over the tribal infrastructure that's already happening. And so it's kind of like when, um, I think it was France at some point in the 1800s, instead of trying to do a seven day week, they tried to do a 10 day week to try to mix up the schedule uh, for people uh, because they wanted to exert some power to say, no, we don't do seven days anymore. We do 10 days. It'll be easier. It'll be better. And, and it didn't work. And they're back on seven. And so, uh, so these are the folks, Ben Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, Ben Decker in uh, Makaz, Shalabam, Beth Shemesh and Ilan, Beth Anan, Ben Hesed in Aruboth, Soko, uh, all the land of Hefer were his. Ben Abinadab in Nafath Dor, he was married to Tafat, daughter of Solomon. Ba'ana, son of Ahilud in Ta'anak and Megiddo, and all of Beth Shan next to Zerth below Jezreel, from Beth Shan to Abel Mahola across the Jok Jokmiam, Jok ah, that one. Ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead, the settlements of Jair, son of Manasseh in Gilead were his, as well as the region of Argov and Bashan in this in its 60 large walled cities and bronze gate bars. Ahinadab, son of Ido, in Mahanaim, Ahimaaz, and Naphtali, he married Basmath's daughter of Solomon. Ba'ana, son of Hushai, and Asher, in Aloth. Jehoshaphat, son of Pura, in Issachar. Shimei, son of Ella, in Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri, in Gilead, the country of Sihon, king of Amorites, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. He was the only governor over the district. And so some of these were close to the tribal areas, but there were overlaps between the different ones. And all of these different people, these different uh, governors of these 12 areas were responsible to, to provide tribute to the king's household. And the king's household was not just to Solomon himself, but to all of the people who were in Solomon's employ. Um, and so his family, and as well as the people working in the palace, the the military, like it went beyond just Solomon's house. It went to all of the folks. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. So things are looking good. Solomon's kingdom is strong. Solomon's daily provisions were 30 cores of the finest flour and 60 cores of meal, 10 head of a stall-fed cattle, 20 of the pasture-fed cattle, and 100 sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. For he ruled over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River, from Tifshah to Gaza, and had peace on all sides. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. And that is, that expression is something that will come up again and again um, in uh, the prophets as well, saying, looking to the promise of peace that the Lord will give to the people of Israel on the day, the day after the day of the Lord, that everyone will be under their own vine and fig tree. And if you have watched Hamilton on Disney+, Plus, like my family has a hundred times, 
there's a line in George Washington's uh, resignation letter where he quotes Isaiah and is talking about the dream to leave the public life as, as, as what Washington is getting at, to leave the public life, to go to enjoy the land that, he's, that he, is, he owns. And he says that everyone would be under their own vine and fig tree. To like just like for somebody like Washington, who was a man of war for so many years, to say, I just want peace. And so that is a significant image of uh, the promise of peace from the Lord. Um, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. That's another thing, a warning for the kings. They should not have many wives, nor should they have many horses. Here we are, we see David or Solomon accumulating many horses. The district governors each in each month supplied provisions for King Solomon and all who came to the king's table. They saw to it that nothing was lacking. They also brought to the proper place their quotas of barley and straw for the chariot horses and other horses. So Solomon's kingdom looks good. It's prosperous. Things seem okay. Um, and it's big. This is the biggest uh, zone of the kingdom like that they'll, they'll ever have. And a lot of it is because it doesn't necessarily mean that there are Israelites living in all of these places, but Solomon has influence over all of these places. They're, they're his, um, they, they give tribute to him. They're his vassals, is essentially. So he is doing well. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding and measure, uh, as measureless as the sand on the sea shore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezraite, wiser than Heman and Kelkol and Darda and sons of Mahol. And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3000 Proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish, from all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Solomon seems like a pretty awesome dude. Like, look at all the things that are going great for him. Because God is faithful. Not necessarily because Solomon is faithful. God is more faithful than Solomon is. God promised Solomon, I will do all these things for you. He is making it happen. Um, and we will see things start to fall apart for Solomon. Um, I think next week we'll get to that, maybe the week after. Um, yeah, but we'll end there with chapter four. So any, any questions on uh, 1 Kings 1 through 4? It's a lot of stuff that we kind of flew through, but you know, I tried to find a good, way, good place to stop earlier, and there just wasn't one. So... <laughs> David died. Can we assume that Abishai remained in the temple? The in the in the palace? Yeah. Um, probably. Yeah. She was probably part of the not part of like Solomon's harem, but a part of the household and probably cared for by Solomon. Because she couldn't really, even though she was a virgin, she couldn't really be given to somebody else to marry like it would be very weird and so we don't really get a clear direction of where she is but here's one of the questions that we do have in the song of solomon we are told sorry i need to open up to it this is one of those books that you know we preached through one time as a church. I probably won't ever do again. Um, it's like, that was fine. Uh, the, the, the beloved is referred to as a Shunammite. And so there are some who may claim that the beloved in the Song of Solomon could be Avishag. That 
maybe Solomon then eventually married her, which is not because he is the king. He would have the right. And, you know, in my 21st century sensibilities, like saying that a person has the right to do something like that makes me feel gross. Um, but <laughs> he would have the right to her. Um, and so it could be her here. We're not explicitly told that. Um, but that is one of the things that people have suggested at some points. So, yeah, good question, though. Because she's part of the challenge with so many women in the Bible is the writers often treat them like furniture that has just moved around. Um, and, and so that's, we don't get the whole story all the time, which is not cool. Um, but again, they didn't ask me when they were writing this. <laughs> so I'm going to just, just trust the Lord knows what he's doing here. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? Mm. All right. I'm not really question. Isn't oh, oh sorry. Previous, sorry. Go ahead, Carrie. Oh, go. Okay. Um, previously, when David was told he wasn't be able to build the temple because he had blood shed on his hands, mm -hmm. and so Solomon. So in a way, Solomon kind of squeaks out of that one. He has blood on his hands, but not technically on his hands. He's still killing people. Yeah, well, Solomon has people killed. He doesn't do the killing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's his, <laughs> he kind of David does some killing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So it's why it makes you wonder. He might have had the same mindset. He just never acted on it. Never had his own hands involved in that. Um, he, uh, may, maybe, but he never had to. That, I mean, that's the real thing. Like, David... More than just have like executing justice, David was a man of war. And so he killed a lot of people in war. Solomon, mm -hmm. Solomon has no wars. And so he is a, he is a man of peace um, yeah. because there were no wars during his reign. And so that's why he is in a better place than David to build the temple because he's not a man of war. So sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say that part you said about the donkey, you know, a future king riding on a donkey showed that um, he came in peace and he had no fear of them. Mm -hmm. Think about Jesus when he came in. Rode right. on a donkey. He came in peace and he had no fear of people there. Right. Yeah. And that's also fulfillment of a prophecy in the book of Zechariah, to looking to the messianic king that he will ride in on a on a on a donkey. Um, yeah. So it's all all of these things are intentional and like we see these little breadcrumbs like you thought yeah. solomon was a good king here comes a really good king uh yeah. here comes jesus so yeah good. and it's all interwoven yes it's all one big beautiful amazing story over yeah. thousands of years so so yeah thank you for expanding that on me it was like a light bulb <laughs> very good awesome renee do you have a question no Okay. All right. It's all good. All right. Yeah, no, we, it is late. So let's, uh, let's wrap up and we'll be back next week. Uh, and we'll just, we'll be starting in five and we'll probably get through seven, maybe into eight, maybe. Oh man. It's so much cool stuff. All right. Yeah. We'll, we'll get, we'll start with five. Let's start there. Uh, so at least read chapter five. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. Talk to y'all later. Right. Have a good night. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, Jason. Bye.